club. Okay. So welcome everyone to the October edition of the Coachpreneur Project. Um, we were co-founded by Deborah Woods, the amazing Deborah Woods, my friend who I met uh, at the Mayo Clinic uh, the wellness coaching program and by myself, our objective is to spread evidence-based wellness strategies and stories powered by lifestyle change and positive psychology throughout the world. And, and this amazing group that we have gathered here today indeed represents most uh, parts of the world, uh, I would like to believe. Um, between Deborah and I, we have long years of cumulative um, corporate healthcare, medical devices, foods and beverage research and education experience. And most of all, we're very passionate about bringing creative community-based projects to life. And uh, we, we thank the team at the Mayo Clinic to actually uh, you know, be our cheerleader and, and to help encourage us uh, to create this platform uh, the way it is shaping up at this point. Thank you so much, Jamie, who's also with us today. We're so glad to have you and your support. So uh, here's how the agenda is going to look like. Um, we'll very quickly get into our expert session. Um, today's topic is, as you guys all know, create a powerhouse small group wellness coaching program for yourself and your clients. And our expert is Annalise Evanson. Um, and uh, I, I welcome you, Annalise. Uh, we'll hear a little bit more about Annalise and her work and experience from Deborah. And um, I encourage you to please uh, you know, write your questions in the chat box and we will try to get to as many questions as possible either during if it's very urgent or uh, right after um, you know, Deborah and Annalise have um, you know, finished the session. So with that said, I'm not gonna um, take any longer. I, I'm handing you over Deborah so you can uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, our expert. Sure. So before I dive in and tell you about Annalise Evanson, I want to share with you a few months ago, I was not a group wellness coach. I had fantastic training from Mayo Clinic and have loved working one on one with clients. But for me, I felt like I want to work more with groups. What's the next step for me? And it was to take the training. And so this summer I did and has broken doors open for me in terms of enriching my practice and working with groups, but also opening the doors in terms of working with organizations, working with companies, working with school systems and supporting them in wellness in these pandemic times and beyond. So it's made a tremendous difference for me. So that's one of the reasons I'm so excited to have Anna Lee Sevenson in conversation with us today. And as Nivi said, if you have questions at any time, please put those in the chat box. If we can weave them into our conversation as Annalise and I talk together one-on-one -on -one initially, uh, we will answer those questions. If we don't have time, then we will do our best to answer them at the end of the session. So the reason we're here is to have a conversation with Annalise Evanson today. I want to take just a moment to introduce her introduce you to her as our coach, counselor, and educator expert. Annalise Evanson has been coaching for 20 years. She is a professional certified coach with the International Coach Federation, a registered ICF mentor coach, and a nationally board certified health and wellness coach with the National Board for Health and Wellness Coaching. She is also a certified professional co-active coach through the Coaches Training Institute, a certified body-centered coach from the Body-Centered Coaching Method, and a narrative coach enhanced practitioner. She holds a master's degree in counseling and bachelor degrees in philosophy and education from Tufts University and an MBA from Simmons College Graduate School of Management. Annalise joined the faculty for Real Balance Global Wellness Services, Inc. in 2011 and created and launched their training program in group wellness coaching in 2014. And we're excited to have her here with us. She is passionate about sharing knowledge, empowering people on their own unique paths, and tapping into the power of groups. So welcome, Annalise. Thank you. We're so glad to have you here with us. You know, everyone here uh, has an interest in wellness and maybe is even going full throttle in wellness. What I've learned as I've engaged with people in this field is everyone has a unique path into this work. And so I'm curious, and I'm sure others would love to hear, how did you find your way into group wellness coaching? And what would you like to share with us about your journey so far? Yeah, yeah, you know, 
I think my journey actually began when I was very young <laughs> because I was an only child and I spent a lot of time alone. So I was just drawn to big families. The bigger, the better. <laughs> and they terrified me and fascinated me. So, you know, I spent a lot of time kind of quietly observing. And I think I learned a lot about the power of observation and then slowly kind of feeling my way in. Um, professionally, uh, my, my, my first career was as a staff psychologist in community mental health in Boston, Massachusetts, and I was drawn to doing family work, family therapy, and group therapy. Um, after 10 years um, in community mental health, I left, I got an MBA, and I went to work on Wall Street <laughs> in operations and technology. And, um, and there, I, I did a lot of large-scale project management, and, and I know Nivi is very familiar with this, but where you're bringing large groups of people together from diverse backgrounds that having different agendas, experiences, skills, um, requirements, and getting them all to come together and, and work as a team cooperatively and collaboratively towards a common end. So I learned a lot of what to do, what not to do, what works, what doesn't work. So that was kind of my, my background on the, um, the, the facilitating or leading side. But uh, during the time I was in community mental health and in the corporate world, I also had experience as a participant. And I'm bringing this up just because I think that my, my experience as a participant was every bit as valuable, if not more so, than being a leader. So when I was in community mental health, um, way back when, it was considered really important for therapists to, um, to engage in something themselves. So uh, their own you know, analysis or therapy so that you really knew yourself and you didn't bring your own stuff into the, 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 the uh, therapeutic milieu. So I went into group coaching. I was a participant in group coaching. For um, and I'm not. I don't really remember. It was a year and a half or two years, and I really learned a lot as a participant. What it feels like, and and what really worked as a participant. And when I was in the corporate world um, during my my 40s, and I spent close to a decade, really, I'm um, doing my own personal growth, personal development. So I engaged in a lot of different kinds of uh, programs, group programs, small and large. But, um, and, and it's either sometimes a weekend, sometimes ongoing, sometimes 12 day intensives. Um, places like Esalen Institute in California, Omega Institute uh, in New York. So, so by the time I got introduced to coaching in 1999, wanting to do group work was really just very natural for me. It was, was something I wanted to do. Um, and I'll, I'll just share with all of you. Um, I started my coaching training with the Coaches Training Institute. And when I was doing that, I partnered with uh, someone who was doing the training and we, we designed a one day group coaching uh, experience. And we spent so much time working on all the little details and we had it down, down, down. And, and it was a colossal disaster. It was just awful. It was like we were in two different movies. <laughs> so, uh, I think one of the, the worst parts of it for me was that I didn't understand what happened. So after we finished the, the training program, uh, both my colleague and I went into the Coaches Training Institute leadership program. And that's where I really got it. I found out what was wrong and, and what, was, what was right. So, you know, what I discovered was really have to get out of your head, get out of the t -t 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 and all the specifics and making everything absolutely lined up um, and, and really learn to trust. So trust the process, trust yourself, trust your group, trust your co-lead if you have one, really just, you know, tap into the energy and listen at all levels and just let it go. <laughs> So from there, it's just been kind of a, a positive trajectory. <laughs> yeah. 
So a very natural evolution for you, personal interests, yeah. professional interests, and then engaging really training, but also being part of those group coaching experiences. And I know, and probably most people on here, if you've been engaged in that group coaching experience as a participant, it's incredibly powerful. And then to think about creating that experience for others where you bring them together mm -hmm. and you provide structure and framework uh, is exciting. Mm -hmm. So when we think about all of the possibilities today in wellness and in wellness coaching, what is so compelling about group wellness coaching that we should think about if we really want to maybe go deep into this work? Yeah, you know, so there are there are benefits for any kind of group coaching. Um, and I, I, I suspect that a number of you um, here are aware. So, you know, things like um, being a part of something that's bigger than yourself. And in the group, what that can mean is having a sense of accountability to the group, not just to yourself, which really promotes uh, accountability. Um, participating, you know, and, and reaping the benefit of the wisdom of, of the whole. Um, having the support of the group. Um, cost, um, re reduced cost may be a factor for some. And on the corporate side, um, economies of scale, um, reach, you know, opportunity to reach many more people across departments, divisions, geographical locations, and things like increased productivity, decreased absenteeism. But um, Deborah, to, to speak to your question very specifically in terms of health and wellness coaching, there are um, three things that I have really noticed that group coaching um, speaks to very, very specifically. So one, uh, the first one is, has to do with readiness for change. So the group experience can really help people progress along stages of readiness for change. Um, the second is something I think of as engaged education. And the third is sustainability. So um, I'll just talk a little bit to, to each one of this. So readiness for change. You know, we know that nobody changes unless they're ready to. And we know from James Prochaska that only 20% of a population is going to be ready to make behavior change. So you can expect in a group, 80% of your group is going to be not ready to make behavior change. So the value of the group in helping people move through the early stages in one-on-one -on -one coaching, you know, the client is the focus, the, the whole spotlight is on the client. In group coaching, that isn't the case because the spotlight is shared. So in group coaching, the really resistant or really ambivalent client has an opportunity to kind of sit back and observe and just notice. So they'll start to notice things like, oh, that person's where I am. Oh, I'm, I'm not alone in this. Um, so a sense of relatedness starts to build. And then they'll notice things like, oh, oh, that person used to be where I am. Hmm, they're making changes. Oh, how are they doing it? Oh, it seems to be valuable. So what happens is people have an opportunity to, um, to observe and learn, develop a sense of hopefulness that it's possible um, to have experience of support, but also have this uh, really important opportunity for vicarious learning that, you know, you don't have in the one-on-one. -on -one. So they get to watch the other participants and get ideas. And I've seen people move from one stage to another. I've seen people move pretty quickly. And even just moving from one stage to another is a really big deal, as you all know, in, in health and wellness coaching. Um, in terms of engaged education, in health and wellness coaching, you know, one of the things that differentiates it is that very often our clients really need some education. They don't know the what, or they don't know the how. So in, in group coaching, 
the the structure is that we we provide education in in short bursts, so five to ten minutes, but it's followed by an opportunity to reflect on it. Hmm. Okay. What 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 do I notice? How does that impact me? And then collectively as a group to sit back and and kind of chew on it, think about you know how how is this relevant? How could I, how does this uh, impact me? How how would I apply this? How would I use it? So the whole group is is thinking about this, and then um, you know if they all decide they're going to try it out outside the group, they go and try it out, and then they come back into the group and they share their experience and they share their learning. So education becomes much richer. It becomes a real learning process, not just sitting and listening. And the second aspect of engaged uh, education is in a, in, a, in a really effective group, the coach may initially introduce some educational topics just to get the ball rolling. But as the group starts to gel and come together, um, the really good group coach is going to start to engage the group. What do you want to know? What are you interested in? What do you want more of? What do you want less of? So now the group is also engaged in what's relevant to us. What do we want to know? And they're engaged in the decision making. So learning becomes a, a fully engaged process. And the, the third piece, which is sustainability, um, I'll just give you all a little example, um, um, a corporate example. So a, um, a colleague of mine um, began doing a, a pilot project in a manufacturing company. Um, seven years ago, she started, she delivered this pilot and she brought in this engaged education and um, the, the, the focus of the group was healthy eating, but people didn't have an idea of, you know, how do I know what to pick in the grocery store? How do I know what's healthy? So she introduced an app and they all went out and tried the app <laughs> and, and they came back and they didn't wait to share what they were learning um, until they got back in the group. They were sharing it at work. They were, you know, everybody's talking together. And, um, and so about halfway through this group program, that first one was, I think, 16 sessions, there were people, other employees who were saying, can we come in? Can we come into the group? It was sort of like the movie when Harry met Sally, you know, they wanted to have <laughs> what this group was experiencing. So the long and the short here is that she is now in her seventh year. She's just started. Um, she did a group during the summer because she was asked to, which is unusual. Um, but now she's starting her seventh year. She's starting seven groups in this organization, two of which the theme, the topic has been collaboratively identified by the employees. It's something they really want to explore and discover. Um, the organization has made all kinds of changes to healthier options, food options, um, offering the, the group wellness coaching program. And um, their costs, their healthcare costs have gone down. So in this organization, it, what's happened is it, it's really evolved into um, a culture of wellness. And there's just this tremendous sustainability. And this potential is just, it's just out there. So thank you, Annalise. There's so many things to get excited about when I think about, when we think together about group wellness coaching and the difference it can make. There's the relatedness, there's the engaged learning, vicariously learning from others, many things to love about. It. And I think it probably resonates with most, if not all of us. So if we're excited, we're in, like, I wanna do this. I want to engage in group wellness coaching. The next question I have is what are some of the important considerations for designing a group program because it's different from one-on-one. -on -one. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so um, the three things really um, come to mind. One is that it's really important to know your audience. You know, that's, that's not such a novel idea. All marketers know you have to know your audience. 
Um, but if you know your audience, if you know who they are, what they want, what they need, it's going to inform so many other aspects of the group. It's going to tell you what are the topics or the themes that are relevant and interesting to them that, you know, where they'll really be engaged. Um, it's going to tell you um, what kind of venue is going to work best for them in person or group or, or uh, remote. Um, you know, now we're, we're kind of in this pandemic, mostly remote, but wasn't always that way. And it's not always going to be that way. And it can also really inform us about the structure. So what's going to work best for this group? How many sessions? Uh, what's the frequency of the sessions? Session length? Um, so it's going to give us so much information just knowing who they are and, and what they want. Um, the other thing I think that's really important to know and understand, um, the roles a, a group coach plays. So they're, a group coach wears three hats. So one hat is as a coach, one hat is a facilitator because this is a, a group experience. And the third hat is an educational hat. Now, every group coach, you know, uh, wellness group coaching experience may not include education. But the reason you need to wear that educator or have that understanding is that you really need to understand how adults learn. What's, you know, what's going to make the experience the most productive. So understanding the, the, the roles, the hats, Understanding how, how they, they blend and, and work together in a group um, is going to, well, first of all, it's gonna help you be an effective group coach, but it's also gonna help you understand where your strengths are, you know, what you're coming in with your strengths and what you need to develop um, or work on. And then the, the last thing I think that um, is really important to understand is um, how groups evolve. You know, they go through some different stages of, of evolution. So, um, you know, in the beginning, people are a little shy, tentative, and then they can become a little contentious. But the, the, um, the intention of any group coach is to get the group to a point, you know, if, if it's just a real, you know, one to four sessions, we're not talking about that kind of group. We're talking about one that goes on maybe 12 sessions. Um, the intention of the coach is to get the group to a place where they're, they're really, um, you know, they're, they're almost running it on their, their own. They're really, uh, they gelled, they're working together, they're working collaboratively, they're, they're, they're coaching each other. And the role of the group, uh, the coach actually starts to recede. So, um, Understanding the stages that group go, groups go through helps the coach um, get the group through each stage so that they can get to that really high performing place within the group. So much to unpack in all of that. The first thing that you shared is really this idea of we have to know who our audience is. Mm -hmm. And I for sure have experienced that as I've worked with educators, with medical professionals, very different, right? Both facing certain stresses during the pandemic, yeah. but in providing the best service for them, we really have to understand who they are and what their needs are. So I think that's key. And yeah. then providing that structure and also watching how the group evolves and being aware of that. I know in the training that I did with you, we had 14 sessions with 10 people in our group. And it was really interesting to watch the evolution of the group over time. By the end, we had really gelled and taken on more and more. So I've experienced that for sure. And I'm sure others have as well. So, so I'm, just, I'm just noticing that you said, um, I noticed the evolution of our group. <laughs> It wasn't the class, so you really experienced a group, uh, a group, an essence of groupness in that class. <laughs> Very much in a way that was personally and professionally enriching, a place to come together to be focused on wellness individually and then also professionally. So, so you know, I've bought in. I really believe in group coaching, and I believe that it is the future in terms of developing these cultures of wellness within our nation and our world that are so much needed right now. With that said, 
when you think about designing that group experience and you want to create the richest possible experience, what are some of the considerations for enriching that? So it's not just more time on Zoom with the Zoom fatigue or whatever the case may be. How do we make that the richest possible experience for participants? So um, all coaching is essentially experiential and, and no different in, uh, in, in group coaching. And um, Jennifer Britton, some of you may know who she is. Um, she's really a leader in, in group and team coaching, not specifically health and wellness, but um, group and team coaching. And she talks about um, bringing in experiential exercises into group coaching um, as the backbone of any kind of uh, group program. So coaching is essentially experiential. It, there's a, a, a cycle, you know, people take action, they experience something. Then coaching uh, ensures that we come back and we have an opportunity to really reflect on it. And, and then once we noticed, you know, what, what did, how did this experience impact me? What am I noticing? Then there's an opportunity to step back and, um, and, and evaluate and assess what's the relevance for me? How can I use this? And then what's the next step? And so that, that cycle continues. And uh, we can bring that into the group. We can bring that experiential cycle into the group. So, um, you know, the, the experience may be a very personal experience, like a guided visualization, or it may be an interactive experience where you have two or three people uh, interacting together. Um, but in the group, again, you know, it, these experiential uh, opportunities, again, short bursts, five to seven minutes, and then the opportunity to come back and reflect and then the group collectively to assess uh, what, what does this mean? What's the value? And then, hmm, how can I apply this? So taking it outside the group experience, trying something out, having an experience, coming back into the group and sharing again. So, um, so the, the uh, experiential component is, you know, it's, it's, it's what coaching is and we can have it contained within the group and, and you know, have it uh, outside, in the outside and coming back in. Really critical piece, I think, of um, group process. I agree. And you know, when we think about creating rich experiences, we can each develop these toolkits of all these possibilities. So when you're designing that group experience, you can pull this out and that out. And last Saturday, uh, inspired by, um, you know, this whole idea of enriching the experience. I was working with educators in Wyoming and it was three hours guys on a Saturday afternoon. And we know educators are just working nonstop right now. And probably the last place they wanted to be was in this session, but we had so much fun. And one of the things we did to enrich it was three minutes of dancing to some pop music, turn your camera off, let's dance. And then we came back and sort of um, processed that together and they're taking it with them and just those micro bursts of exercise and energy. So thank you for inspiring that, you know, in my experience with you. And it's one of my favorite parts now of planning these group experiences is, okay, I've got the structure, I know who it is, how can I enrich this? And then you just start exploring the possibilities and talking to others and you go in and then you watch and see what difference it makes. Mm -hmm. it makes a great difference that they can take with them. I think they're much more likely to, take what they experience in the group experience when it's truly been ex experiential. So thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. So everyone knows here we are together. Uh, yeah. We have gone virtual as never before in our world. And with that said, when you think about these group coaching experiences, how do we make the most of them online? Well, you know, when I, I first started teaching this, this group class, there was a lot of resistance to doing remote, uh, remote group coaching. I've done remote group coaching telephonically and uh, in webinar, and I've done in-person groups, and they all work if you, if you believe in it. But I think that necessity is the mother of invention, and, um, 
you know, we're, we're in a time where people really have had to go uh, remote. So um, previous resistance to, to, to learning, um, you know, for coaches, that kind of that resistance has really uh, shifted, but for everybody, for our audiences too. You know, I, I have heard people say, oh, you know, I can't work with a senior audience because they don't use technology. Well, they all do now, you know, if they want to see their grandkids. <laughs> so everybody is getting used to using technology. So it's, it's across age, culture, social groups, um, and people aren't, aren't as afraid of it as they used to be, and they're really discovering benefits. So, you know, it's, it is interactive. It's, it's not the same as being able to physically touch but it is interactive. Everyone can see each other. Um, we can use breakout sessions. We can use chat. Um, people can communicate two ways and in, in remotely. You can't do that in person. You know, you can communicate verbally and and through the chat. Um, and you know, Deborah was just talking about having this great dance breakout session. Um, when it's remote, very often people will do things that they might not want to do in person, that they might feel a little intimidated or shy about. But if nobody can see them, uh, very often they're willing to try something uh, that, that they're not otherwise. So, um, and, you know, I think also the technology has just changed so much. I mean, I think Zoom is just amazing what it's, what it's been able to offer us. So what you've shared, the idea that really it's group coaching that has the power and whether we're in person or whether it's online, it can work and we can create that. And probably most here have experienced that we can create that environment that supports change and well-being online. Yeah. And when you said that, it really resonated this idea that, OK, people might be willing to try things if you say, OK, I'm going to put on some music. Let's do a micro burst of movement and they get to turn their camera off. Uh, they danced because when they came back, they were a little bit winded, but they felt so much better. <laughs> yes. So there's been so much that we've talked about. We're going to talk about a few more questions um, before we turn it over to open Q&A. So have your questions ready for those of you who would like to ask. What else, Annalise, would you like to share with us about group wellness coaching? Well, I think um, all of you might be interested to know that the National Board for Health and Wellness Coaching is actually in the process of identifying core competencies for group coaching. So it's, you know, it's considering group coaching every bit as important and valuable as one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, the process started two years ago. Um, I was able to participate in that in Philadelphia at the National Board of Medical Examiners, and we kind of came out with a, a rough structure. Um, and they continued in a project this summer, um, and they either have given a draft of the new uh, competencies um, to, to the board or they're about to. So what's, what's just, I, I want people to know is that this, is, this has credence um, and it is considered a really valid and important uh, vehicle for coaching. And I'm excited to see that, to see when it comes out, to really understand what are the competencies and what's kind of the framework for group coaching. I think it can do a lot to help us stay clear on things and to inform our practices. So with all of that said, when you think about the future mm -hmm. of wellness coaching and in particular group wellness coaching, what are your hopes and dreams, Annalise? Well, you know, I'm passionate about this. So my vision is, um, is threefold. Um, I want to see it grow and expand. So I want to see it continue to grow in the sectors where it already is. I want to see it expand into new sectors. I want it in corporate, nonprofit, education, medical, government, and Main Street. You know, I want it everywhere. And I want it to, um, to reach everybody. I would like to see many more people have the opportunity to experience and benefit from, from coaching because of, you know, group, group coaching is, is a more um, um, accessible and cost-effective uh, means. So um, I, I don't want it to just be for executives. I want coaching to be for everyone. Um, 
I'd also like to see a huge expansion across themes in wellness. Right now, you know, uh, groups tend to focus a lot on healthy living or healthy eating, healthy moving, uh, managing health risks, which is, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, uh, but there's just so much more. So uh, with COVID, a lot of coaches are now focusing on managing stress and um, helping people tap into their own inner resilience. But, you know, if we think about John Travis back in the 70s in his wellness inventory, identified 12 dimensions of wellness. We could take each of those dimensions of wellness and explode them out into, you know, five or six sub dimensions. So um, it, topics and themes of wellness really are only limited by our imagination and what's relevant or important to the audience we want to work with. So I'd like to see a real expansion in the topics and themes. Yeah, so an expansion in providing this for more people, right? But also in topics and themes. And in terms of more people, I don't know about all of you. I suspect you're seeing at least some of this. But more and more, I have company heads and stuff contacting me saying, whoa, we're struggling in our organization. My people are stressed. This isn't just going away. And so the need is great. So to be part of meeting that need, we're definitely on the front lines, right? I mean, this is really, we're pioneers in this field. And it would be nice if someone had like a book where we could find out exactly what we need to do. So we're kind of writing the book or making the plane yeah. as we fly it, right? Yeah. So an exciting time. That's one of the reasons I'm so um, interested in being engaged with others about this subject and so glad, Annalise, that you could join us today. So you offer four, 14 weeks of training, and I just finished it a couple of months ago. Um, it is amazing. It's intensive, but it's taken me to a whole new level. And I would love for you to share what people can expect in that training and any thoughts you have about that. Yeah, you know, I'm just gonna make another comment ab about what you said because I come from the world of technology and we used to talk about leading, leading edge and bleeding edge <laughs> technology. Um, and I think that in terms of health and wellness coaching, we're on the leading edge. And with group coaching, we, we may even be thinking of ourselves as kind of on the bleeding edge. So, um, you know, we're looking for, for new pioneers to, uh, to, to get out there and do this. My program uh, is designed to emulate group process as much as possible within the context of a class. Um, what it covers are the, the essentials of group coaching. So, so the real, the basics, um, and how to integrate the basics and the essentials of health and wellness coaching into a group program. It's highly interactive, it's highly experiential, um, everyone in the class has an opportunity to do, we have something called a practicum. So everyone has an opportunity to design and deliver um, a group session and then get feedback. Um, everyone has um, a buddy to, to brainstorm and, and think about and chew on some of the key concepts and how you might apply them. And um, everyone has an opportunity to design a group plan that includes all of the essentials and, and brings everything together at the end. And um, we are, for anybody listening uh, here today, um, we're, we're going to offer all of you a 10% discount um, off of the next class that's starting in January. So I don't know, Deborah, if we'll be putting that information out somewhere. Yes, so those who are attending live today, if you're interested, you will receive a 10% discount in that training. Uh, Annalise, is there anything you would like to add to the training or before we open up for Q&A? Well, so I'm gonna put you on the spot. <laughs> okay. so, so, you know, my intention is that, that people walk away with, um, if they're not enthusiastic about it, at least they have a solid understanding. And, um, and that they have a level of confidence as well. So what, what did you walk away with? Oh, okay, so much. And if anybody wants to ask someone who's been through the training, you wanna contact me directly, I'd be happy to have a conversation with you. But I knew before I took the training that that was the next step for me. That I do enjoy working one-on-one -on -one with people, but you can only help one person at a time that way, right? The need's much greater for that. 
And then you have the economies of scale where maybe people can have access to the support that we can provide, but can't necessarily you know, afford a one-on-one. -on -one. And so I went in really thinking, okay, I wanna do this. And uh, like everybody else experiencing pandemic times, I have young adult children, they all poured in from all over the world. <laughs> South Pacific, Russia, there they were. So I'm in my home working, trying to like have time to work while also having unexpected family plowing in. So I had to really think about whether I was going to take the training or not. Is this the right time? But it felt right. I was ready. I wanted that next step. So I dove in. So many takeaways. It was everything that she has shared that it is. It was um, very rich in terms of experiential. It helped me to sort of elevate my practice, even with my individual clients in that way. It also gave me a framework for understanding navigating with groups because you need to provide some structure, but you absolutely need to dance in the moment. And then we had opportunities to actually show that we could do these things. And it was a little bit nerve wracking because there were people who were in high places in healthcare and stuff. And there I was, you know. Uh, new group wellness coaching presenting. And so Annalise and I had a discussion before that and she used her coaching skills on me. She could tell I was nervous about having to present to this whole group. And she said, okay, just stop. What's the experience that you want to have while you are presenting your practicum? And I said, joy, I want to have joy. And so I think that that's what we created. So the experience with Annalise in this training was joyful. It was structured. It provided me with checklists. It gave me experience. And um, it has profoundly for me, and I sound like an advertisement right now, guys, I get it. But it has pro profoundly changed my perspective on the work, but also my trajectory in terms of what I'm going to do and what I am doing now professionally engaging with larger organizations to come in and provide real support. I don't think I would have had the skill set. Yes, I had the coaching skills deluxe model because the training at Mayo Clinic was so exceptional. With that said, to engage with the larger groups, I needed this in my toolkit as well, and it has been that. So Anyway, and there are two other opportunities um, if you go through the, the, the class, and that is to continue on in a co-mentor group so that you, um, as Deborah's doing, I'm so doing you it get to um, you get to, to work together to, you know, support each other and get ideas um, and try things out. And there's also an opportunity to um, to be a participant in a group, a group of coaches like yourselves. Um, and to have the experience on the, the participant side. Yeah, and so I think the experience really enriches my coaching in ways that I'm excited about and that are going to allow me for the rest of my life in doing this work to do it in ways that I might not have been able to do it otherwise. So we've had a great conversation, Annalise and I, and you can tell that we are both very much um, excited about the possibilities for providing support in group settings. But you all have come with questions and we'd like to open it up for the next 10 minutes or so for you to ask those questions. I'm gonna look at the chat box and see because I know there have been some questions. So give me just a moment to, and, and Jamie, you seem to have a question right now, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Thank you for all of this. It's exciting. Um, I've done a bit of research and I've also studied extensively with Michael Orlowski, so I know about the group coaching training there. Um, I'm a little confused. I would just like to know if Annalise's program that you're talking about, which sounds wonderful, is in fact that program at Real Balance or if it is a separate uh, offering. If you could distinguish that for me, because now that these group programs are starting to populate, it's really confusing. It, sure. it is the Real Balance program. Great, thank you so much. And thank one more quick question. Question. Can you apply what you teach to groups that may not be uh, focused on the topics of health and wellness? You know, there, there's a body of, of essentials that apply to any kind of group coaching that you do. Okay. I figured, but I just was curious because I, I work in a lot of corporate environments where that may not be uh, what is required or requested. And well, so, and, you know, and don't forget, it, it doesn't have to be about eating and, 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 and health risks. 
yeah. you know, um, can be work-life balance. And of just, course, of course. Thank you so much. I'm really yeah. excited. Thank you. Great, great. Okay. And, and to add to what Annalisa shared about that, Jamie, I was contacted by a healthcare management company recently to come in and do some team building, which doesn't usually fall under my umbrella per se, but uh, all of the skills that I have, I was able to do that and had a lot of fun doing it. I, I tapped into the VIA via strengths mm -hmm. and uh, talked about that. And it was, it was so much fun. I thought I'm gonna do more of that. So another question is Annalise, how large can a group be? Is there a maximum number of participants that should make up a group? Yeah, so I, I adhere to the International Coach Federation standard there. So the smallest number is two and I have done groups with two. And the largest, uh, according to um, ICF, is 15. I think that um, if, particularly if you're if you're not co-leading, um, you don't really want more than 10. I think around eight is kind of an ideal number, but um, you don't absolutely don't want more than 15. And, and you know, just you have to think about um, things like how how long are your sessions. And are you going to give everybody an opportunity to, you know, to have their say and to, to weigh in? Mm -hmm. Sure. So another question we have is in a corporate setting, how did the employer measure decreased medical claims within the group? Uh, I don't know if you have- The example that I gave? Yeah, um, actually I, 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 I did have, I have spoken with the CFO in that program. And the reason they brought that coach in was because they were taking their um, health insurance in-house. They had been told by three of the, the big health insurers that their costs were going to go up 25%. And that's, you know, this is a medium sized manufacturing company. So that was a big deal. So they wanted to take their insurance in-house and they started this program. And after the first year, just the first year now, they're, you know, they're in the seventh year now, but I, I did speak to the CFO and their health costs went down 40% at the end of the first year. Now, you know, he said, it's not just because of, of the group program, but I know it has a big part to play. So I can tell you that the CFO said their, their health care costs went down 40%. Yeah. So a potential reduction in healthcare costs. Uh, I have a question to kind of go along with that, Annalise. Do you have any thoughts on um, when we sort of pitch this to organizations and companies and say, here are the benefits, what are some of the benefits that they might look at to sign on for? Well, I mean, that, that's a really good question. And I don't think it's a cookie cutter answer. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that what, you really need to do in an organization is understand who the organization is, what's important to them, because they're going to have different, uh, different goals and, and different uh, criteria, things they want to meet than the participants in the group are going to have. But it's absolutely critical that the organization has buy-in and a sense of ownership. Um, so, you know, they, they may be interested in cost reduction as this, this manufacturing company was. Um, they may be interested in economies of scale. So, you know, how do we reach a whole lot more people? We have divisions across the country. Um, they may be interested in, um, in dealing with, you know, particular health risks that are rising that they're, they're noticing in their uh, employee population. Um, but what's important is really taking the time to understand, you know, we're treating the organization as a client in the same way we're teaching every participant in the group as a client. Um, there was um, a, a very powerful example of, of a coach who did a great job um, with women in a, in a big corporate company. Um, the women were leaving um, in droves, particular because they, they weren't being promoted. And um, if they started families, they, they were, weren't being treated well. And so she did a group with the women to, to help them um, 
identify kind of work-life balance and, and how, how to be in this milieu. And it was very successful, but the, the company had not bought into it. And so all the, the, you know, the, the, the forward movement that they made in two years was almost completely wiped out when the company said, oh, we're not gonna fund this anymore. So um, it's, you know, it's, it's really finding out what's really important to them and getting buy-in. Yeah, so finding out what's important to them, getting that buy-in, having those conversations. And I think you've shared with me recently, sometimes those conversations take time. You go in, you talk to an organization, they may not immediately buy in, but you're sowing those seeds. And as I've conversed with organizational heads, they are starting to feel desperate to provide real support for their people and well-being and not just lip service. We're here for you. We want you to feel good. Let us know if you're struggling. No, they really know that that's not working any longer. Yeah. And so just giving them a tangible opportunity with the work we do to provide that support, whether it's a one-time presentation that's sort of group focused or ongoing group coaching. So yeah. thank you for for that. Uh, one final question before we move to wrap up, I think, let me check and make sure I'm not missing something. Okay, so one final question. Someone has asked, will NBC HWC, so the National Board for Health and Wellness Coaching, will they be considering an additional uh, certification for group versus individual? Oh, I, I couldn't even begin to speak to, to that. Um, I, I don't even want to. <laughs> Right. So uh, my sense is probably not, but, you know, but it just having uh, core competencies gives people a structure. I certainly hope not. <laughs> One exam was enough, right? <laughs> it was enough. It was. Um, so, but having those core competencies is really key because I think there's so much information about how best to conduct groups. When you can look at a certain document online and you see this is what they're saying. And then of course you can tweak it and change it for your personal practice, but it's just key to helping us focus, providing the best value of service for others. So, well, we are going to close the Q and A unless there's one final question that anyone has. Um, Yes, Martin. Yes, hi. Yeah, hi. Uh, my question, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Okay, great. My question is one that I've asked everyone I've worked with because I struggle with it. And by way of background, I retired from the corporate world more, um, three years ago after spending more than 40 years. So I relate to a lot of what you're saying, ran thousands and thousands of employees and executives in 17 countries around the world. The difference is it was a condition of employment to be in those groups whether it was voluntary or gee, it was a chance to expand my learning, or it was a free lunch and a day away from the job. So people came to it. The question is, how do we get folks to be motivated to come to a group when it's not a condition of employment? And more specifically, going back to the Prochansky uh, stages of change, how do we deal with folks who are at pre-contemplation or, or barely contemplation in terms of, because really the goal with any coaching session, having run so many groups, small, and I've run very large groups with multiple facilitators, it's about making personal behavior change. How do we do that when the folks are still way back at pre-contemplation? Yeah, so I, I think we don't have enough time, but I mean, I'd be happy to address it afterwards a little more. Um, you know, part of it is that the group really gives people an opportunity to sit back if they're in pre-contemplation or contemplation, and even in preparation, you know, so you get there forever oh. preparing people. So they, they don't want to step across the line into behavior change. Right. Um, so it gives them an opportunity to sit back and see what other people are doing and experiencing. Um, it takes the pressure off. So, um, you know, that's, that's one way groups can really facilitate movement um, from one ch uh, stage of change uh, to another. Um, another thing that's really important is, um, in my opinion, is that people, um, the point you're making, um, you know, we see a lot of incenting going on in corporations to participate in wellness programs. In my opinion, it's really important that um, it's it's the individual's decision to participate. Exactly. Yeah. Or although I will tell you, I have seen coaches who have run groups where people are incented, and um, because of the way they've structured it and run it, um, people 
did finally get engaged, but she created autonomy within the group or they've created autonomy within the group. Um, so, you know, there are things like relatedness, like me, so I can trust everyone. Sure. Um, autonomy, that's really sure. important. Um, appreciating the individual so that they feel appreciated, seen, and heard, and nobody's going to force them to do anything. Um, yeah, and fairness, a sense that I'm being treated fairly. Sure. Really important. I Great. think that's probably all we have time for. I appreciate that. Thank you. Very helpful. Yeah. Thanks. So great question, Martin, and all of your questions. They've been helpful to each of us as we've participated in this together. And Annalise, what a joy it's been to talk with you today and to share um, the excitement of the possibilities with others. So thank you for that. And I'm going to turn the time over to Nivi to wrap us up. Uh, thank you so much, Annalise, and thank you so much, Deborah, uh, you know, for uh, curating and designing such a fantastic uh, session for us, a Annalise. This has been very informative, um, extremely insightful, and I'm pretty sure that every single person who attended and uh, will be um, listening into the recording uh, will walk away enriched and, and very excited to explore your program that's coming up in January of next year. Um, uh, hey, guys, uh, we have two minutes to go. The only thing that I will say is group coaching is here to stay. Whether it's healthcare, whether it's uh, corporate context, whether it's you know medicine, not medicine, um, anything, whether it's team building, et cetera. Um, we are going to be continuing with this uh, particular topic next month as well. And we will be joined uh, by Jean Storley, who uh, uh, you know, was a VP at General Mills. Uh, she has a corporate background. Uh, she, uh, you know, is a, uh, is a creative problem solving expert. She's a senior trainer at SIPSI, which is a creative problem solving conference. Uh, do check that out. Uh, and, and she's written a book and uh, she's uh, going to be holding a raffle. And one of you guys, uh, whoever joins, will have an opportunity to be able to take away this beautiful gem. This is all about business storytelling. And that session won't be in an interview format. It will be a 90 minutes hands on workshop where you will get to look at how uh, you apply storytelling in, in a group setting or even in an individual setting, irrespective of whether you're discussing health or non-health related topics with your client or your clients. So with that said, I am going to say goodbye on behalf of the Coachpreneur Project. Annalise, thank you so very much again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.